Hey folks, Quilletian here, and welcome to another European Results 4 tutorial for complete beginners. And we are going to look at the Holy Roman Empire today. I had a lot of people ask me questions about how the HRE works and um, how to play around in there. So that's what we're going to look at today. First of all, the Holy Roman Empire is basically an area that covers sort of Germany and then some. Um, this area over here, all the various colored bits that you see here are part of the empire in some way. The Holy Roman Empire is a collection of otherwise completely normal, independent nations. Like, look at Saxony over here. It starts to aim no relationships whatsoever. Um, it's just a normal country, just like any other in the game. Um, they just happen to be organized underneath this, this Holy Roman Empire. There is a country that the country's leader is also the emperor of the HRE, and all the nations that make up the HRE are princes below that emperor. And there's a little bit of a kind of a mutual protection pact going on here. The general idea with the HRE is this. Um, the emperor gets certain benefits from being the emperor, but has a certain responsibility to ensure the sovereignty of the princes that make up the HRE. That comes both from um, external threats, but also certain internal ones. So, at the start of the game, Austria is the emperor. There's always a country that is the emperor. I mean, technically, it's the leader of that country who is the emperor. Whatever. The country is the leader. That's the way it works. We can see, uh, at a glance, using this imperial map mode, we can see Austria over here, which also has a little bit over here, uh, is in purple because it is the ruler of the HRE. All the green countries are countries that are uh, that belong to the HRE. They're princes in the HRE. The brown countries are special because they're actually electors within the HRE. And the stripy territory represents provinces that are in the HRE but don't actually belong to a country that is a member of the HRE. So let's take a look. Really, the whole Holy Roman Empire thing is a province by province thing. So if we go and we zoom in over here in this province of Sternberg, actually, you know what I'll do is I'll show off down here. That'll, that might be a little bit better for more people. So if I go and just click on Brescia, Brescia is a province that's in the Holy Roman Empire, and I can tell, well, first of all, I can tell from the map mode because there's something going on with the color. But in normal mode, if it's selected, over here, I see a little flag that says, Brescia is part of the HRE. So is, say, Tyrol. Verona is not. Verona is grayed out here because it is not part of the HRE. This whole lack of space here, I'd never noticed that before. This, is this a glitch that was added in a, in a patch, or is it because I'm playing vanilla? It's quite odd. There should be a space between Verona and is. So a little bit odd that it's not there. So membership to the HRE is province-based. In addition to that, if your capital... So, for example, Milan here is a province and is the capital of the nation of Milan. This province here is in a, the HRE. As a result, the nation of Milan is considered to be one of the princes in the HRE. And you can see this if you right-click on it and open up the diplomacy view. We can see that for Milan, it is part of the Holy Roman Empire. To compare... Let's take a look at Venice over here. The capital of Venice is on the island of Venezia over here. And if we click on this province, you can see this province is not in the HRE. As a result, if we right click on Venice and open up the diplomacy screen, you see there's not that little shield to show that they're in the HRE, right? Compare Austria, Venice, Austria, Venice. You see this golden eagle? It's not there for Venice. So Venice owns some territory that belongs to the HRE. In, in some context, but it itself is not a member. This is a great source of tension, and is one of the reasons frequently Austria will go to war with Venice early on, because Austria starts the game as the emperor, and one of their primary jobs as the emperor is to defend the sort of sovereignty of the HRE as a whole, which means that a non-HRE member holding HRE territory it's considered a bad thing that Austria or whoever the emperor is at the time, it's their job to correct that. And so if we go back to the imperial map mode, any bit that's stripy here represents a province that is owned by a country that is not part of the HRE. Um, countries can choose to move provinces in and out of the HRE by clicking on this button. So we are Saxony over here. So if I clicked on a province and I tried... In theory, I should be able to click this button and remove the province from the HRE. However, I'm not allowed to do that as Saxony because I'm an elector of the HRE. It would just be, like, incredibly weird and bizarre that I should be able to remove this province from the HRE. But it is something that's possible to do. There's a variety of diplomatic um, repercussions to doing some of these things. But, you know, that's the sort of thing. Discover on your own. I'm not here to tell you what all the math and all the numbers are. Just to try to instruct some of the mechanics. Okay, so... 
Uh, provinces belong to the HRE, and whether or not the capital belongs to the HRE determines if the country as a whole is. But other than that, it, Saxony is just a normal country over here. Um, Silesia is an example of a country that is in the HRE, because you can see the little flag, but actually starts off as a vassal of Bohemia. And that's fine, they're, they're both part of the HRE, and that sort of thing is allowed. So, what's the benefit of being the emperor? What's the benefit of being part of the HRE? Well, one of the things, so if we look here, Savoy over here, or Savoy if you prefer, is part of the HRE. Again, we can compare that here. And France is not. If France were to declare war on Savoy, even if Savoy has no allies whatsoever, okay, Austria will still get a call to arms. So when, let's say you're allied with someone, and someone declares war on your ally, you will get a call to arms to defend your allied country. You can choose whether you're going to join the war or not. If you say no, usually you'll break the alliance and you'll lose a bunch of prestige. If anyone from outside the HRE declares war on anyone inside the HRE, the current emperor, and again at the start of the game, that's Austria, gets a call to arms. They can say yes and join the war on the favor of the defenders, or they could say no. If they say no, I mean, there's no alliances to break or anything like that, but rather the emperor will lose something called imperial authority. We're going to get to that in a moment. But basically, being a member of the HRE means you've got a good chance that you will be protected by the Emperor. In particular, if you keep good relations with the Emperor, they're going to be much more likely to defend you. That doesn't only happen from external threats. Internally, some of that happens as well. Now, uh, let's say, so I've loaded up a Saxony here. Let's say I declare war on Anhalt. Austria, or whoever the Emperor is at the time, is not going to interfere or intervene in my war. I'll, fight, I'll declare war, I'll, I'll fight the war, I will win the war because they're tiny, and then it comes time to negotiate peace. Now, when I negotiate the peace, if I were to simply annex Anhalt, actually, let me back up. Let me back up. Let's say I declare war against Bohemia. Same situation, we're both members of the HRE, Austria will not intervene, I fight Bohemia, I beat them. And in the peace deal, I demand this province of Eger? Eger? I don't know. I'm going to call it Egger. Um, I demand this province because it's got gold, therefore it's super awesome, so I want this province. So I demand that. I take it in the peace deal. Now, of course, we've looked at now, if you if you take a province in a peace deal, you will own the province. It'll be colored as part of your country, but you won't have a core on it right away, right? You have to spend administrative power in a certain amount of time building the core, making it a core part of your country, making it a legitimate part of your country, you know, putting up all the correct flags, that sort of thing. Well, what will happen is if I hold territory that is a part of the HRE, and this province is, right, but I don't have a core on it, the emperor can, uh, that, that's called unlawful territory, and the emperor can demand that I return this unlawful territory to its proper owner. Again, one of the promises that the emperor does to all of the princes that belong to the HRE is to say, I will protect your territory. Now, because, you know, things, the emperor won't actually interfere in an internal war, but if someone takes territory from someone else, steals territory from someone else, then the emperor can say, no, 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 that's not okay. So, assuming I took this province, and assuming the emperor decides to call me out on it, I'll get a little pop-up flag that'll say something about unlawful territory, and then I will have the option of returning that territory territory to the person I took it from, or saying no. If I say no, the emperor will get a casus belli against me. They'll get a CB against me. They could declare war uh, because I said no to returning unlawful territory. They will often ask you to return an unlawful territory. That, that is, you can pretty much guarantee you will be asked to return unlawful territory. Most of the time, you will simply say no. And most of the time, the emperor will not actually declare war on you. They'll be busy, you'll have too many allies, that sort of thing. Um, you know, but if you're too weak, and you don't have enough friends, and the, the emperor's got a bunch of manpower they're not doing anything with, then they might decide to go ahead and declare war um, to try to return that, uh, that territory back. So that's one thing that happens. The other thing that can happen is if you go, if I were to go and actually declare war on Anhalt, win, and take this province, okay? So we're sort of in the same situation as before, where I have taken land, but in addition to holding unlawful territory, I have actually gone and annexed, because there are one province minor here, I have gone and annexed an entire country. The entire country of Anhalt would be gone. And regardless of the unlawful territory thing, Austria would most likely have a CB against me to liberate this country. And they could declare war, and um, as part of the peace deal, they could demand that I release Anhalt 
again as a, as a country again, make it independent again, sort of resurrect Anhalt. And if the Emperor does that, they will get a whole bunch of Imperial authority and stuff like that. The Emperor's job is to keep all the princes alive, internally or externally. That's what their job is. Internally, as a member, you get the benefit that you are more protected from external forces, and arguably you might there might be a way if someone takes some territory away from you, the emperor might step in in your favor. Although that that doesn't come up quite as as frequently because well as a player usually you're going to be winning wars. But it's really if you like you're on the border and you're worried about France or Poland or Hungary or or uh, maybe even Denmark is running around crazy up here. There's different options, um, so that'll come up. All right, so that's the real benefit as a as a member. What's the benefit to being the emperor? You got all these responsibilities. God, you're going to get called in against France. You're going to do all these things. What's the advantage of being the emperor? Well, there's a variety of different bonuses. Um, does it actually does it say it on the screen? Oh, it does. Cool, excellent. So it does sell it here. So if you are the emperor, you get a bonus of spy offense. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. You get a big boost to your yearly prestige, which is quite nice. Uh, you get an extra choice of advisors. So when you go and hire advisors, which we've looked at, right? We normally get a choice of three. Well, if the emperor, if you're the emperor, you get a choice of four. Which is a nice little thing, so you can, um, you know, you've got more options, more likely to get the kind of advisor you want. Uh, you can have another leader without upkeep, so an extra general, basically. You also get plus one diplomatic relations. This is really important in, well, in general it's nice, but it's really important in HRE. So normally, you have a limit of four diplomatic relations, right, with four countries. So it doesn't matter how many relationships you have with any one country, it still just counts as one. So royal marriages, alliances, that sort of thing. So typically, you tend to build up an alliance web of like four allies or maybe you know three allies and a vassal or something like that if you go above this limit of four you start to lose diplomatic power every month uh, from or you gain less I should say diplomatic power every month so generally you, th you know that's your limit so as the Emperor you get to have one more than that so you can have more allies now that's nice in general because of strength but it's also really important from a diplomatic point of view and really the HRE game is a diplomatic, I, I don't know, it's a diplomatic wonderland. If you love diplomacy, this is where you want to play because there's a lot of different reasons for that. One of the reasons is it's actually quite hard to play a pure militaristic aggressive game here in the HRE um, because you know about aggressive expansion. We've talked about it in the past. Basically, if you take territory from someone, you generate aggressive expansion because your neighbors will take note of that and potentially will start to get scared. If you build up too much aggressive expansion with your neighbors, they may join a coalition against you, which is like sort of a super alliance, where if you attack anyone in that coalition, the entire coalition declares war on you. It doesn't even matter if the people in the coalition like each other or they don't need alliances with each other, it doesn't matter. If you attack anyone in that coalition, they will all declare war on you simultaneously. And any one of the people in that coalition could declare war on you, which automatically grabs, grabs all the coalition members, which is scary. Because again, most countries will have maybe at most four allies. So that's, you know, about as big as a war could get is maybe four on four. But with coalitions, you could suddenly find yourself fighting 10, 15, maybe even 20 countries simultaneously. That can happen if you're too aggressive. The amount of aggressive expansion that you generate through your conquest is... Uh, scaled based on distance. Countries that are further away don't care as much. It also scales based on culture and religion. Nations with the same religion as you and nations with similar cultural backgrounds. See how all this is sort of a beigey yellow? These are all Germanic cultures. They're subdivided into Westphalian, Saxon, Pomeranian, etc. But they're all Germanic over here. They will take it. So between the Catholicism, the shared culture, the fact that everyone is really close together here, and that proportionally taking Anhalt as Saxony is actually a pretty big jump, that generates a massive amount of aggressive expansion. And most likely, that's all you'll be able to take. And you're going to have to wait like 10, 15 years for all that aggressive expansion to burn away before you feel safe enough to take more conquest. Playing in the HRE, especially fighting internally, is not a good way to expand. I mean, a little bit. You nibble here and there, tiny little bites. Um, but you have to play it very cautiously. Now, expanding outside the HRE, that's a whole other thing. Uh, they're not in the HRE. Uh, they may not have the same culture. Of course, later on, once the Protestant Reformation starts up, you break up the Catholic bloc, you get a few more targets as well. Um, but yeah, that's one of the reasons. If you do play in the South, over here, it's quite nice to go after the Latin countries down here because... Not all of them are in the HRE, particularly Venice is not, for example, so as Austria it's a great target. Venice is not in the HRE, they're not Germanic, it's a little bit more of a target. So, you have to play the political game that way, but then comes the real political game. 
hey, this emperor stuff. All right, so you got a lot of responsibility, but um, you get some nice perks, right? You get these various modifiers. Not only that, right? And you get the extra the diplomatic relations, that great, but the big one is the one at the bottom. The 57 princes and zero free cities in the empire give the following to the emperor. 28,000 more manpower and 28 more land force limit. Hey, as Saxony, what's our current manpower limit? 12,000. So if we became the emperor, our manpower would go from 12,000 to 40,000. We would triple, or well, more than triple. We would more than triple our maximum manpower simply by becoming the emperor. And what's our current force limit? Our force limit is 10. We can have 10 regiments and that's it. If we became the emperor, we'd have a force limit of 38. That's pretty good. Hey, I want a piece of this emperor pie. How do I do it? All right. So the emperor, unlike what you might expect, is not, it's not an inherited title. title. Right now, Friedrich uh, III von Habsburg of Austria is the emperor, okay? So we often say Austria is the emperor, but wait, really, it's Friedrich who's the emperor here. When Friedrich dies, rather than passing the title of emperor to the next heir of Austria, instead, there is an election. And the winner of the election becomes the next emperor of the HRE. So it is entirely possible for Austria to stop being the emperor. It's entirely possible for us to start being the emperor. It's actually possible for anyone, um, anyone Christian, I think. Well, certainly Catholic at the start. I don't know if Orthodox can become um, the, uh, the emperor. When the Protestant Reformation starts... Uh, I believe at when it starts at that point, unless I'm mistaken, you can still have Protestant electors, and I'm pretty sure they can elect a Protestant emperor. Uh, I don't think I'm lying to you there. Although at some point, there will likely be a giant religious war, basically like the Thirty Years' War kind of thing, um, especially if you have the Art of War expansion, which adds some great detail there. Eventually, there will be a clash between the Catholics and the Protestants as to what the official religion of the HRE is. And after that is won, on either side. From that point forward, only people of the winning religion can be electors and be elected. Uh, so it's a pretty big deal. Um, but there is going to be a little part piece in the middle where you're going to have a, a split down the middle between Protestants and Catholics sort of vying for control over the HRE. Okay, so how do you become that? So how, there's going to be an election. How does the election work? Well, in the HRE, up to seven countries, and at the start of the game, there will indeed be seven countries, can be electors. In fact, if for any reason someone stops being an elector, which can happen, you can. Uh, there's ways to revoke whether someone is an elector or not. A country could just disappear completely, which could happen with Cologne. Cologne over here, or Köln or Köln or whatever. Anyway, Cologne is a one province minor. It's quite easy for this uh, country to just get gobbled up and destroyed, at which point, they, well, they don't exist, so they clearly wouldn't be an elector. Um, so we'd be down to six. The... Emperor is highly incentivized to name, uh, to always have seven electors, otherwise there, there's a bit of a penalty. Um, and ideally, losing an elector is a great opportunity for the emperor to give emperorship to someone um, who likes them a lot, right? Because then it's like, well, great, I, this is my friend, certainly they must vote for me. So, there are going to be electors, and actually the reason I picked Saxony is because Saxony is one of them. And again, we can peek at the imperial map mode over here, and the brown countries are the electors. Usually you don't care about that view. Usually you just check over here. And what they will do is they will set their vote. So for me, I can cast a vote and I can pick any country I want in this list. Note that, you know, some of them, like Portugal, I could vote for Portugal if I want to. I could say Portugal should be the next emperor. In single player, this almost never happens. It's almost always a country in the HRE. And the reason for that is... Um, that the AI has a variety of different modifiers to determine who they vote for. Um, and because of the way they work, it's very much likely to be a country within the HRE. And it's in fact very much likely to be a country with Germanic culture. That's one of the big barriers in there. Um, but it is possible, it is possible to get someone else, and especially in multiplayer, where, you know, if you get a bunch of human players as uh, electors, they can vote in like all kinds of crazy different options over there. But basically that's it. So we are Saxony, we can vote for whoever we want. Um, 
probably we'd vote for ourselves, I'm just saying, which is the default. Right now we are voting for ourselves, um, but we could vote for someone else and we might want to. We might not want to be the emperor. We might not want to be the defender of the Holy Roman Empire right now. We might not be ready for it. Also, if you vote for someone, they're going to like us a lot. So you can do that. And you can change your vote. You vote ahead of time and you can change your vote, I think once per month or something like that. Um, so how do you get someone else to vote for you? Well, I don't have to go into the real numbers. You just mouse over one of these shields. So if I mouse over Trier over here, it can see we can see exactly how much they like us and how much they like the per, the other person they're going to vote for. Um, if if they happen to like us more, if they, if they did like us more and they were going to vote for us, this would show us who's in second place. So right now, they are rating us at 76 points and they're rating Austria at 141. That's a pretty big difference. But we can see the numbers why that works out. One of the big differences, in fact, it's a 50 point swing, is we are getting negative 25 because we're a little too small, and Austria gets plus 25 because they're one of the largest nations in the empire. One of the ways to get more votes is to become bigger. If you are bigger, you will get a modifier here. The other way is relations. Uh, we have a, Currently we have a 25 relationship with Trier, which is why it shows up in that bonus. So we could encourage Trier to vote for us if A, just improve relations, that will help. Uh, B, if we grow, if we, you know, as long as we're the same culture group, same religion, all those things. Diplomatic reputation is quite interesting. You, I don't know how much we covered it, but if we look at our country's diplomatic view here, we've got a number that says diplomatic reputation. And actually, we got a slightly higher diplomatic reputation than average because that's one of the benefits to being a member of the HRE. We got higher, um, diplomat, uh, uh, higher diplomatic reputation. Um, diplo rep is incredibly potent for getting votes. Notice we have a Diplo rep of two, and that translates to a plus 20 modifier to this. This is almost enough to invalidate the small nation penalty. And then if you're like, oh, Diplo rep's really good. If you look at the various idea groups that are possible to take, the diplomatic ideas are stupendously good because they give you an extra diplomat, which means you can suck up to more countries. They also give you plus two diplomatic reputation. And actually, so does influence ideas, another plus two. If you got this and this, that would be an extra plus four. That would be another plus 40 to whether people would vote for us or not. Incredibly potent. Um, not to mention the fact that you get extra diplomat um, and we can get uh, more diplomatic relationship slots as well. More diplomatic relationship slots means we can generate more alliances and more royal marriages. And actually, that's yet another way to improve whether someone votes for you or not. Because first of all, being royal married to someone and being allied to them gives you a relationship boost. So already the relations number is going to improve. But then beyond that, you actually get a static bonus for being royal married and being allied to an elector. So if I were to royal marry, now I can't royal marry Trier because they are an archbishopric, okay? They're a theocracy, you can't royal marry them or Mainz, or I think it's pronounced more like Mainz or something like that, or Cologne. You can't royal marry any of them. You could ally them, although right now they're being a little neutral, we could easily um, ally them, that wouldn't be a challenge. But let's say we go to um, Brandenburg over here. Brandenburg, oh, they actually would be willing to ally us, interesting. Or Royal Mary. Let's go ahead and ally Brandenburg. So let's take a look. Right now, our relations are plus 24. Yep, plus 24. And if we mouse over here, it's yeah, plus 24. Yeah, okay. So we're going to offer an alliance. And I'm just going to pause for a day. And there we go. So the 12th. So now, see, our diplomat went. They said yes to the alliance. So first of all, right away, we get a boost to our relationship. Because you get a plus 50 boost to your relationship when you're allied. So if we look at Brandenburg here, it correctly gives us a plus 74 for relations. It was plus 24, now it's plus 74, because we get extra plus 50 to our relationship from being allied. But not only that, if you look at this chart, you can see we also get a plus 30 for being allied here. So the alliance is doing double duty. Um, royal marriage is the same way. Royal marriage gives you a 25% boost to relations and also shows up as, I, I think it's a plus 10 modifier here. Um, you can check out, I definitely recommend you go to the, uh, literally it's eu4wiki.com and look up the Holy Roman Empire on there and it'll give you a massive list of all the different modifiers that can affect whether someone will vote for you or not. And um, so the trick to this, and now see, we've got a plus 14 here, right? If we let the game go for a little bit, Brandenburg, I don't remember how often they update their, their votes. It might be once per month. So we might have to wait until December 1st, but Brandenburg will now vote for us to be the emperor. So if we do that for, say, uh, well, we've got ourselves, 
Um, and all you need, you don't need like a majority or anything like that. You just need a plurality. You just need more votes for you than to any, for anyone else. So we're voting for ourselves, obviously. Looks like Brandenburg will likely vote for us. If we can get one other person to do that. So let's say we start uh, sucking up to Cologne over here. Oh yeah, we can't. Might be someone else. Ah, there we go. Mainz. Let's go ahead and offer them an alliance. And then again, wait another day. They've said yes, and we just have to close and open this window so the numbers update. Mines is now at plus one with us, and we could send them a diplomat once once we have the ability to go and improve relations a bunch with them. And then these two people will now vote for us, and we're going to vote for ourselves, which means probably whenever Friedrich dies, we will become elected. Of course, this whole time, Austria will be going around trying to suck up to people and make friends as well. So it's going to be a bit of a battle to see who can become the next emperor. So, becoming emperor, huge benefits. Any other thing going on with the Holy Roman Empire? Yes, there's this thing called imperial authority. This represents the amount of control the emperor exerts over the princes of the empire. Princes are just all the countries that make up the empire. And authority is needed to enact reform decisions within the HRE. So, having high imperial authority, actually, first of all, increases the chance that someone will vote for you. If you look here, and you look at the bottom, why Brandenburg rates Austria at 141, 20 points out of that is the imperial authority. So literally, this rating here makes it so that the princes, the electors, are more likely to re-elect the current emperor. So this is a bonus towards the current emperor, or the current emperor's country, which means it's much easier. If once you're emperor, it's easy to maintain emperorship. Um, also, the plus one diplomatic reputation or relations here means you can have an extra ally and an extra royal marriage, which again lets you suck up to a few more people. So it's still easy. It's easy once you've got it. It's a little easier to keep, but it can still definitely be lost, especially if you do anything that upsets a lot of people. Like, for example, develop a bunch of aggressive expansion that will upset people. Another way you can get people to vote for you is if you go and vassalize one of these electors. Now, these electors will not be willing. Uh, almost certainly to be diplomatically vassalized. But if I went over and just conquered Cologne over here, if I conquered them, and in the peace deal, I forced them to become my vassal. First, do keep in mind that will generate aggressive expansion in the HRE. It will upset a lot of people. A lot of people also get very upset if you vassalize an elector. Uh, diplomatically, that is a pretty rough move. But that elector is basically guaranteed to vote for you. So between ourselves, if we went and vassalized another couple of people, we would be guaranteed... Uh, to be elected. Well, not literally guaranteed, because really the other four people could vote for someone else, but that happens very, very rarely. Once you've got a couple of uh, vassals here, um, usually it'll be impossible for a voting block to come up against you. Uh, but it's possible, especially since they will hate you. So those are ways to get some extra votes. Vassalizing is definitely a way to do it. So then, let's say you're now the emperor. You got a bunch of imperial authority. It's great. At some point, this is going to light up. This button will light up. And it happens in order. The call for Reich's reform will come first. If you are, if this lights up and you're able to pass it by hitting this check mark, then at some point, Institute Reich's Regiment will come up and you work your way down from top to bottom. These are reforms. Each one of these um, effectively is centralizing the HRE more and more and more and making them, instead of being a bunch of individual countries that just happen to all bend the knee to an emperor, it, it'll bring them closer into being one single country. So if we pass the Reich's reform, what would happen? Both the emperor and all members, so everyone in the HRE, would get a 5% discount to build costs and they would produce 5% more trade goods. Hey, that's that sounds great. That's excellent. That just helps everyone around. What's the next level? Next level is a little bit different. A member of the HRE will get minus two national unrest, and the emperor specifically gets plus one diplomat and plus one diplomatic reputation. That's really powerful. Again, that will help the current emperor stay emperor, but the rest of the members can't really complain, right? They get lowered national unrest, and it keeps going like that, where Everyone sort of gets a bonus on each one, but the emperor tends to get a bigger bonus. Look at that tax income and so on and so forth. Then it gets really funky down here. Uh, actually, I guess I'll show you that. If you get to this level, proclaim Erb Kaisertum. I, I, don't, I don't know how to do German. Um, but if you can get to here, HRE is now always inherited by the same country. Whoever the emperor is when this gets passed will now forever be the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, what's the next level? Revoke the Privilegia. This makes it so that every single nation in the HRE becomes the vassal of the Emperor. It's worth noting this does not use up diplomatic reputations, which is good because right now there's 57 princes there. Could you imagine having 57 vassals? 
Well, A, that would be awesome, but it would cripple you diplomatically, except those people don't count against your limits. So it's 57 free vassals. It is worth noting that an individual country can refuse to become the vassal, and in fact, some countries will. Ma in making this decision tends to fracture the HRE into the ones that like the emperor enough to become their vassal, and the ones that hate them and refuse. And then the emperor does get claims on all the territory that refused, and therefore, usually the next you know, few decades is the emperor waging war on these other countries to bring them back into the HRE's fold and recombine the HRE. In fact, the theme of the emperor really is about continuing to preserve the integrity of the Holy Roman Empire and its borders. We've always ta already talked about how they can defend from external and internal forces. And we're going to see exactly why that's important in a moment. Final decision is epic. All the nations that are still part of the Holy Roman Empire unite into a single country. There will no longer be an Austria and a Brandenburg and a Bohemia. Instead, there will simply be a single nation called the Holy Roman Empire, and whoever the emperor is, that person owns the entire country. And that's it. This just map will just change. It'll be a giant gray blob of the Holy Roman Empire. Very powerful. So, at this point, you're like, okay, I know how to get elected. That's great. I want to pass these reforms. How do I pass them? They're all grayed out right now. Well, there's two parts to them. One, you actually need enough imperial authority to pass a reform. Um, that, that's thing number one. So you need to keep this ticking on. But the other thing you need is you need people to say yes to it. You've got to convince the princes that it's in their best interest, at least for now, to pass these reforms. Their, their people will be better off. Even the last one, even the last one, you have to, um, I think you have to convince people to do it. Um, yeah, it doesn't give you... Oh, yeah, right, because you can't vote yet. But yeah, because you have to convince them it would be a lot better if we're all just one big country. It would be fine. We'll be happy that way. So you have to convince people to do it. So you can see there are 19 princes that are for the reform and 38 against, which is one of the reasons we can't pass it. The other reason is we don't technically have enough imperial authority, but we can't see that right now. How do we get the princes to say yes? Well, if we mouse over a prince... So let's see here. The first one who would say no in this list is Alsace. So this is Alsace over here, and if we mouse over, we can see why they would refuse to go for it. Um... They, because of uh, economical power, they would say no. They're a theocracy, so they're slightly more resistant than some of these others. Um, that is one thing. The emperor is not their same culture. So we're all Germanic, but Alsace specifically is Swabian, whereas we are Saxon, I suppose. So that's a penalty there. But we do have a really good diplomatic reputation. You can see we have a diplo rep, or Austria has a diplo rep of, what does it have? Can we even see their diplomatic reputation? Huh. I, I, at a glance, I'm not seeing it. Anyway, because um, Austria is the emperor right now. It's not us. But it's not going to get passed because... Um, or what helps is the fact that the emperor has good diplomatic reputation. So again, positive diplomatic reputation is incredibly critical for any of the HRE mechanics. So including passing these reforms. But eventually, um, you know, the emperor could go and improve relationship because opinion of emperor is an important thing here. Uh, so, you know, you spend your idle diplomats, you just send them to the princes. Once you've got the electors on your side, you start to send your diplomats to the princes to try to convince them to vote for things. When your imperial authority gets above 50%, this will start to provide a bonus to these. So even if you do nothing else, as your imperial authority continues to climb, princes will eventually start to vote yes and as soon as you've got a majority over here you can hit that button and pass the reich's reform which will give a benefit and then you can and then it reset it spends all your imperial authority so it brings it back down to zero and then you have to start building it up again because a you need enough to pass the reform and b you probably need a little bit above 50 percent here uh, to convince these princes to accept how do you get imperial authority well we can see this number here we can mouse over it Right now, Imperial Authority is currently growing at 0.14 per month. That's actually quite a lot. Trust me, it's going to be hard to see a lot more than this as the game goes on. Currently, there is peace internally within the Empire. No nation in the Empire, in the HRE, is fighting another nation in the HRE. That's worth 0.1 Imperial Authority per month by itself. And we can see that's most of our Imperial Authority right now comes from that piece. That's obviously not going to last very long. So um, it's very, it's going to be very uncommon when this bonus is available. It's worth noting at some point um, over here at this reform, it disallows internal HRE wars. Nations in the HRE won't be able to declare on other nations within the HRE, but you can still find two nations at war with each other if it happened because of a third party thing. Um, but anyway, so there's that. The other thing is the number of member states. We currently have 57 princes in the empire. And because of the number of princes that we have, 
we get points for that. We get 0.12 each month from that. Quite a bit of points. Uh, you need a certain number for the empire to really be an empire. Okay, if you drops too low, you don't really have an empire anymore. But at 57, that's a lot. This is probably the highest number you're ever going to see. Um, in fact, you're going to spend most of the game with a lot fewer princes than that because people are going to sort of eat, swallow each other. Either internally or externally, princes are going to go away. So that's why one of your jobs as the emperor is to release these princes again. If someone eats another country, you might go to war with the aggressor to liberate the, the country. And you may not take any territory at all because you don't want aggressive expansion or you want to get overextended or whatever because you need to keep your diplomatic situation pristine. And that's it. You, you do this a lot. You will find yourself going to war not to increase, as the, as the emperor, not to increase your old ho own holdings because it would upset people. Instead, you're doing it to liberate a country so that you can get more of these points going on. Also, I think the actual act of liberating a country still gives you direct imperial authority. It used to give you a lot. Used to uh, The old system didn't have any of this ticking stuff, um, and it was mostly discrete actions. This is a lot better. Anyway, so you need a lot of members of the state. But not only that, look, we're losing a bunch of imperial authority because there are 16 provinces that the provinces themselves belong to the empire but those provinces do not belong to a country which is a member of the empire and we saw that earlier with Brescia over here Brescia or Brescia is a province in the HRE but Venice itself is not so this province is owned by a non HRE member and that brings down our imperial authority and in fact that's what all the stripey territory is everything you see striped is a province owned by someone who doesn't actually bend the knee to the emperor therefore as the emperor one of your jobs is to go and bring that back into the HRE you don't even necessarily need to own it yourself you just need to make sure that it's not owned by someone outside the HRE so you could um you could feed it, you know, if, if someone has a core on one of these provinces, which happens a lot, uh, like Neumark over here has, ah, there, see, Brandenburg has a core on Neumark. So you might want to declare war on the Teutonic Order, go and siege Neumark, and force the Teutonic Order to return Neumark to Brandenburg. As Austria, assuming that that's who you're playing as, or whoever, you're not adding territory yourself, but you are adding territory to the HRE, and helping to improve your imperial authority. Very, very different kind of game plan, very fun. Later on, once the Protestant Reformation starts and a bunch of countries start to become Protestant, one of the giant drags on your imperial authority are any are based on the number of countries in the empire who are of the wrong religion. You know, whatever that you know the wrong religion might be. Um, in, in this case, when the Pro when the Reformation starts, it would be Protestant nations would bring you on your imperial authority. In fact, you're likely to see this go negative in the mid game uh, during that religious warfare. Um, and that will remain the case until after you do the big religious league war and the, either the Catholic side wins or the Protestant side wins. And then all the Protestants, assuming you're Catholic, all the Protestants can no longer be electors and cannot be elected. And then you as the emperor, presumably, um, you would then go and give new elector titles out to some loyal Catholic countries, for example. And then you could go to war so you can't do that right now. You can enforce religious unity. There, that is an option that you can do here. If someone, um, if someone turns, it turns to the wrong religion, quote unquote, um, you can ask them to flip back your religion. Uh, but it's quite tricky to do. But that is one ability that you do have. And you do have the option of declaring war on someone and trying to convert their religion. That's always been the case. And that will be one of your tools going forward. As uh, the emperor of whatever religion, you will be declaring war on people to force them to convert back to whatever the correct religion for the HRE is. And it's so, it's so, I love it. I love the HRE gameplay. It's completely different. It's not about expanding your borders, although you can certainly do that. And of course, you can play, you can play a game even as Austria as the emperor and be like, listen, I, I'm never even going to bother passing a reform at all. I have no, uh, no interest in that. The only thing I care about is to use my bonus um, manpower and land force limit to go and beat up everyone. At some point, the number of princes we have will drop to below 25, um, at which point I think we lose all these bonuses. But by then, maybe we'll have grown a bunch and yada yada. You can play a militaristic game as Austria or Brandenburg. I mean, get those space marines, form Prussia, do all that kind of stuff. Those, I mean, you can play a standard HR, uh, EU4 game, but the HR game is so very satisfying and a very different pace. As the emperor, you are just making, trying to keep people happy, try to keep your electors happy so they vote for you, and you are trying to protect your nations and keep all your princes alive, both against internal forces and external threats, and then you do the religious war, and it's great fun. Um, I think common sense added some mechanics for the HRE, but Art of War added quite a few. Uh, one of the mechanics is that, that free city, which was referenced somewhere. 
Yeah, right here it says 57 princes and zero free cities. In vanilla, I'm running this this tutorial with no expansions loaded whatsoever. Uh, so in vanilla, there's no such thing as a free city. But if you have, and I think it's Art of War, it might be common sense. Uh, check the wiki to be sure. Uh, one of them adds the a free city mechanic. And a free city is a one province nation that is a republic. So Lübeck here for an example. This, and in fact, um, I think the game starts with, I think there's seven free cities, but you can have up to eight. Um, so anytime you have a republic, that is a one province republic, you can make them a free city. If they ever expand below, beyond one province, they will no longer be called a free city. But a free city has an extra level of protection. Internal war, if Mia Saxony were to declare war on Anhalt right now, Austria, who's the emperor, would not get involved because it's an internal conflict. But if I were to instead declare war on Lübeck, and if Lübeck was a free city, Austria would intervene. A free city has protection from the emperor even internally like this. So um, the, the emperor will get a defensive call to arm. I think I'm getting that right. Also, the emperor gets different bonuses uh, from free cities. I believe um, I believe you get uh, you get 500 manpower and 0 0.5 land force limit for each prince. I think free cities give you a thousand manpower per free city instead of 500 and I think the free cities also give you more tax money as well so it's quite good to have a lot of free cities you'll get a lot more benefit on the other hand you're gonna get a lot more defensive call to arms because if anyone messes with the free city you will get a, a call to arms and you'll be expected to join in the war defensively you could always say no um, but you know that's that's a guaranteed way to lose a bunch of imperial authority for example and not make friends I hope you found this tutorial to be useful and uh, and productive. I really do hope that you give the HRE game a go. It is a very different feeling thing. Um, it's I feel like it's very reactive. Like at, as Austria or whoever, you know, once you have the emperor, you kind of can't go starting wars, even externally. And you could, right? As Austria, you're free to go and like conquer a bunch of Italy, for example, because most of it's not in the uh, Holy Roman Empire. But if you're doing that, you're spending a bunch of your money. Um, to maintain your army, you're burning through your manpower pool from reinforcing and that sort of thing. And you're also maybe building some aggressive expansion, not making friends, you're overextending, you're spending shimmer points. And then next thing you know, France has declared war on Savoy and you're being called in to this war, but you've just burned through all your manpower doing some stuff in Venice. You really, as the emperor, you have to play a little bit more of a reactive defensive game because you want, whenever um, an external power declares war on one of your princes, you really would like to join in and defend them because it's going to be, uh, it's really bad for your imperial authority if you say no. Plus, if your princes lose the war, it's really, really bad as the HRA gets chipped away. Um, and then also internally, while you don't, uh, other than free cities, you won't get called in. If Saxony declares one Anhalt, you won't get called in for that. But if Saxony goes and annexes Anhalt, then you can go and tell them, no, 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 you've got uh, some unlawful territory. You've got to liberate that. And if they say no, then you'll have a CB. So then you'll go to war with Saxony. Saxony, you'll beat them up and force them to release Anhalt, for example. So uh, a lot of this sort of stuff happens. I think it's great. I think it's swell. Uh, there's no other gameplay in all of HRE, or, sorry, in all of EU4 that is the same as the HRE. This this mechanic is is unique to here. There's a bit of fun funkiness that happens in Japan, but it's not the same. Anyway, uh, that's it. If you got any more questions, don't be afraid to leave me in the comments or email me or tweet me, and uh, maybe there'll be more tutorials in the future. Thanks for watching, folks. Bye-bye.